It's a real pleasure to be with you all. Uh, this conference has uh, gained in importance and uh, really renown around the world for quite some time. Uh, I've been uh, a member of IRE from the very beginning. IRE is the, the institution in the U.S., the investigative reporters and editors, that uh, does many of the same kinds of things that you're doing here this week, workshops, uh, learning sessions. And one of the things I think is so important uh, to all of us in journalism, especially those of us who have a couple miles on us, is to pass along some experiences we've had. Uh, there's a lot of new things in journalism, but I'll tell you, there many of the most fundamental things have not changed at all. Issues such as when do you start writing? Uh, when do you know you're done? Uh, how do you avoid getting diverted? Uh, what all those processes are, are like? And I'll, I'll talk about some of those in addition to documents, but. Before I get into documents, I have to tell you another story. Uh, my wife and I were at an international conference a few years ago, not unlike this. And I had an experience that really goes to the heart of what I want to talk to you about today. At the end of this conference, we uh, decided we would take in a site or two. So we were in Amsterdam, and so we went over to see the Rembrandt House. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, been fortunate enough to see that place in Amsterdam. It's in a very prosperous, uh, nice part of town. Uh, today as it was then, back in the 1600s when Rembrandt lived there. And they urged us to start on the fourth floor and work our way down to the first floor, which we did. And on each floor, uh, it was just astonishing. There would be paintings from the time. There would be Venetian glassworks of a very precise nature, uh, kitchen utensils. Further down into Rembrandt's studio, there would actually be casts of body parts uh, that he had actually used in some of his um, paintings. On down the line, the detail, the precision, uh, the authenticity of this house just absolutely stunned me. I don't think I'd ever seen anything like it because in addition to just creating a period piece, a lot of these objects had actually been in Rembrandt's house when he lived there. It wasn't until I got to the first floor that I understood what this was all about. Rembrandt was a very successful painter in his time, made a lot of money. But like a lot of people who make a lot of money, he spent a lot of money. And he got very deeply in debt. And at a certain point, he had to basically declare bankruptcy because he had overextended himself so much. And when he did that, the bankruptcy court, I can't remember the exact name of it, it was something wonderfully charming like Chamber of Sorrows, or, which actually is a better word for bankruptcy court if you think about it. Um, made an inventory of everything that was in the house because these things were all then sold to try to pay off some of his debts. And for 300 years, the house was sort of in um, disrepair. And when they decided to restore it, they went to the bankruptcy court records. And there, in great precision and detail, were names of paintings he had owned, uh, the kinds of other utensils he uh, had used, the entire house, therefore just became a wonderful um, microcosm of exactly what his life had been like and so forth. And this, of course, really hit home with me because I believe in documents. I've been using documents for years. And this is a perfect illustration of why they're also so important in investigative reporting. They will give you things, color, um, accuracy, a view of a situation that you cannot otherwise get. There's obviously nobody around from the 1600s that you can interview to find out what kinds of body parts Rembrandt used in many of his paintings. Um, documents play just a tremendous role in investigative reporting today. But I want to go back, just come back a little bit with me from the beginning of my career. I've been an investigative reporter for almost really 40 years now, but I didn't begin that way. I began the way I think is not a bad way to begin which is covering everything possible. I worked on a daily newspaper. I covered everything conceivable, catastrophes, covering politicians coming through town. Other famous people would come through and you'd have a little interview. All the things all of us in any kind of daily journalism do. All of, that was my whole early years or in, in the business. Yes, I might read official reports. And yes, I might do a story about a, a big lawsuit that was filed in town. Uh, but that was almost incidental to other things. When I wanted to find out something, when I wanted to get to the bottom of something, to, to do a story, 
I reach for the telephone. That was just the way you did things. And very often, there really wasn't time to do anything else. The fact that there might be another way to get some of this information, uh, to fill in those blanks, to get that color, that accuracy, didn't even really occur to me in those early years. It wasn't really until I got to Philadelphia Inquirer in the early 1970s that I had this epiphany on documents. And for the first time, I saw the power, the reach, uh, the great drama that they can provide in a story. And here's how it came about. Uh, the editor of the paper that at the time had asked me and another reporter who just arrived there to take a look at what appeared to be kind of a burgeoning scandal. It had to do with the housing that poor people were living in in Philadelphia. They were, bought these houses. They were, uh, houses within a few months would begin to fall apart. Uh, the federal government would then, U.S. government would take title to these because they had insured the mortgages on these. And he said, he wondered if there was anything more to the story than that. There was obviously a lot of heartache, heartbreak by the people who were losing their houses. But what else is there to this whole story? So this was the first time Don Barlett and I had worked together. We would ultimately work together for more than 40 years. And so the first thing we did was ask ourselves, what, where are the property records? Because the heart of this were housing and so forth. So we went to Philadelphia City Hall, which is this wonderful pile of late 19th century granite, French Empire style. If any of you have ever been to Washington DC and you know the, um, the executive office building next to the White House, that's, that's exactly what Philadelphia City Hall looks like. Great statues, seven, eight stories up. Anyway, we went to the deed room, the property room. And the first thing we looked at were records of federal government. Are they taking title to certain properties? Because when these houses collapsed, they got title back. So everything was by hand. These are bound volumes. These sound like something out of a scriptorium, perhaps, in like 1600. And I actually think that these books were a dis direct descent of that. All this stuff in this day and age, and every young is, of course, all digitized, all automated. Uh, but back in those days, all the entries were by hand. So in the case of the federal government, we looked at this, and there were just page after page of these federal government entries where they had received title to these properties that they'd insured. We looked back from that to see how they'd gotten them. There were the names of two or three mortgage companies, again, page after page after page of these. Uh, tracing that further back to the actual deeds, the owners of the properties, we found half a dozen uh, real estate companies, again, page after page of those. We then went back a few years and looked at federal government entries to see almost none. It rarely happened, like four or five years before that. So right away, you could see that something very dramatic was happening on this issue. And before I tell you anything more about that, I mean, that's the thing to always remember. Like, Try to think of perspective in any story you're doing. Try to think any way you can bring any broader view to something. And one of the simplest ways sometimes is just that perspective, to just go back a little bit and see what things happened before. When we did that, and we saw that there was almost no uh, activity of any consequence just a few years before that, we knew at that point we were on to something. And we suggested to the editor at that point, uh, we think this is worth looking at. Make a long story short, uh, we spent several months on this uh, tracing the activities of speculators. And what we showed was a classic pattern. Real estate speculators uh, would buy these houses, old houses in the older part of Philadelphia, put a fresh coat of paint on them, uh, dress them up a little bit like that cosmetically, uh, sell them to mainly African Americans or Hispanic people, uh, who actually in some cases thought they were renting the house. It was such a crazy process. They didn't realize they were buying the house. But because the federal government, which wanted to encourage home ownership, was guaranteeing the mortgage, the speculators had no risk. And the mortgage company that provided these people with mortgage had no risk. But then within a few months, the house collapses. The federal government gets the house back. A new speculator, or maybe the same speculator came in, which happened. Puts another coat of paint on the house, resells the house. It was this incredible circle of activity uh, that we wrote about. It was a 
fairly sensational series at the time. Ultimately, uh, 45, 50 people were indicted in the city. It helped change some national policies about that particular program. Uh, but what I want to get back to is that this whole story started for us, again, with the documents. A simple look at the paper to see exactly what might be there. And there was enough there that told us, stick with this, um, go forward. And that was my real introduction to the use of paper documents, uh, which uh, ever, ever since then I've used. And since then, in general, the use of documents in journalism has, has just practically exploded. The color, see, color, the accuracy, the stuff that you can find um, that people see maybe in a paper or on TV, uh, absolutely astonishing. There's hardly a series anymore in the US. I can't speak for Europe, though I do see a lot of the work from over here. There's hardly a series that appears in a magazine, a newspaper, or on television that doesn't have some kind of a documents uh, component to it anymore. And it's part, I think, as much as any single thing, of the sophistication of our, of our business anymore, uh, what we use. And, it, and it's been an absolutely pivotal thing. The heart of this process, to me, is to think of these, to think of documents in a different way. Don't think of just a court suit. Don't think of just a bankruptcy uh, proceeding. Don't think of just an official document issued by your government on something. Think of this as a way to information, that from these, you're able to get things that you would otherwise not go get. I'll give an example. Uh, Don and I did a series many years ago on what was happening to the American middle class. We showed that through a series of uh, federal policies, uh, the American middle class was actually being uh, squeezed and reduced. Uh, tax policy was, was being geared toward people at the very top of the, of the income scale. Uh, regulatory policy, the privatization of a number of industries was eroding really good solid middle class jobs. On down the line, all of these kinds of things were happening. And as part of this story, we had a profile, a very brief profile between two people. One was a woman who'd worked in a plant for many, many years, who'd lost her job after 30 years, and the man who had basically fired her and moved the job uh, at the, in this point actually to Mexico. And it was a story, very simple story of these two people. And one paragraph in the story really stood out for readers. And it went like this, it said, uh, after 30 years, Molly James will get a pension that is less than Andrew Galef, who was the man who had fired her, pays yearly for the care and feeding of the family dog. And it became a wonderful symbol of how some people are really doing very well under the new system and other people are not. Where do you think we got such a, where do you think you get such a statistic like that? How do you, well, we got, obviously got from Molly what she was earning, what, what, what her pension was. But how do we get from, how do we, how do we know what Andrew Galef is paying for the care and feeding of the family dog? Any ideas? The, the dog. Fine. The housekeeper. It could have been, but we. Uh, She's very signed in, signed to she probably would not have talked to us, though. He's going for his bins. Pardon me? He's going for his bins. <laughs> <laughs> probably that could have done it. I was too polite in those days to go through his bins, though. And also, it would have been, would have been too late for that. Here's what happened. Uh, and one of the things you do with documents is you just open doors. You try this door, you try that door, you try that one over here, and you see, <coughs> is there anything behind it? Is there any information there? Well, one of the things we always do when we're looking at people, good and bad, is we just try to develop a profile of them. We don't have to necessarily use it all. But in Caleb's case, uh, his third wife was suing him for divorce in California. Now, of course, she wouldn't talk about this. Uh, but in the court papers, she had filed uh, information that said the kind of uh, money she needed to support the household they'd had. And there were the bills for the care and the feeding of the family dog. <laughs> so the point is, we didn't go to this to look at divorce papers. You go to the divorce papers to look for information that leads you to things that you, that you otherwise will not get. 
Uh, when Don and I began to really push and, and work with documents back in the 1970s, uh, uh, there were, and by the way, I want to emphasize that the documents are not to the exclusion of interviews uh, by any means. We do as many interviews as we ever did. We just try to do a lot of the paperwork first before we do that. So it's not a matter of either or. Both are absolutely extremely important and pivotal to the whole process. But anyway, when we began advocating documents as this great news source and uh, tremendous possibilities, there were some naysayers in, in journalism. I mean, nobody ever made a big deal of this, but saying really nothing important, nothing good is ever written down. Uh, th that's why you need sources who will tell you that most confidential stuff. <coughs> Well, we've consistently found this to not be the case. When we, uh, we did a series a number of years ago on tax reform in the United States, further evidence of what an exciting uh, career investigative journalism can be in the beginning, uh, we began reading the Tax Reform Act of 1986 is what this was, 700 and some pages. And uh, by the way, if any of you have any trouble sleeping, I've really got something for you. <laughs> Just curl up in a chair or in bed with a few pages of the U.S. tax code, and I guarantee in 15 minutes, you're out. I mean, and it's great. It's non-toxic. It's not habit forming <laughs> and it always works. I mean, you're gone. Anyway, well, I was almost asleep one night uh, where I came across this paragraph. There was a whole section of the code which had repealed all kinds of outrageous tax shelters in the Caribbean. But after this repeal, which was a good thing to do, to kind of clean up the code and so forth. After they did this, there's a little thing below it that says exception you know, to this repeal above. It said, such and such provisions above shall not apply to a corporation incorporated in Delaware on or about March 3rd, 19, I think it was 81, and which owns one or, or two or more office buildings in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. Well, I was almost asleep. I got to that paragraph. I said, wait a minute, what is this? Well, it turned out the bill was loaded with these, you know, absolutely hundreds of these things. So when they passed the tax reform, people who had access to the tax writing process through their lobbyists and so, so forth, got to the committees and said, this would be such a hardship for my client. We need to have this. So people who had access then got these things. Actually, you'll never, you'll never, most of us, you, you may think it was just perhaps liberals in the U.S. who were very upset by this. Actually, I can't begin to tell you after this story ran how many rich people we heard from who were really mad because they didn't get one of these things. It had to do simply with the access to that process. But it gets back to the point I'm trying to make, which is it is amazing what is written down. We found hundreds of these. They identified them not by a person's name, but by a, a transaction, but may, by maybe a real estate project, by maybe a bond issue, uh, by where uh, something was done. Because I've been working in these, uh, with documents a long time, many, many people think, well, gosh, you must know where to look in all cases. And the answer to that is no, I don't. The only, what, the only time you know where to look is if you're doing the same story over and over again. Yeah, I, know, I certainly know about deeds and I know about some other kinds of things, but uh, every story is different. Every story is unique. And um, I haven't amassed a laundry list of, of things to look at because it would be pointless for that reason. Most of the things you use, you use them one time and then you move on to something totally different. I had one funny uh, incident with this when we were doing a story on um, energy policy in the U.S. And uh, we'd come across the fact that the federal government had put in place all kinds of provisions that made people wear heavier than usual sweaters in the wintertime. Everybody had to cut back their heat. Uh, gasoline prices were exploding. All kinds of things were creating sort of chaos in the marketplace. But then we picked up some information that for a weird reason, um, fuel that ships burn was remarkably cheap and that the U.S. had kind of become the gas station for the world. Foreign ships were detouring, coming in, filling up. When you, you want to hear a little explanation about a barrel of oil? 
Probably not, but this, this goes to the heart of the story. A barrel of oil, when it goes through a refinery, all kinds of different products come out. Gasoline, <coughs> diesel, naphtha, um, on down the uh, aviation fuel, and even within gasoline, there are different, different things. The very bottom of that barrel is what they call bunker fuel. That's what ships burn. It's the worst kind of product. It's kind of gunky and chunky, and because you're out to sea, people think it's not pollutant, but which of course it is. But anyway, we heard that these foreign ships are coming in. Same time, Americans are like turning down their thermostats, sacrificing, doing what the government told them to do. Here's this thing where people are making out like bandits. So I began calling around the Department of Energy in the US. Do you have any statistics on this? No, we don't. Blah, blah, blah. Finally, I, I find out from the Department of Commerce, somebody does keep this data. And the guy said, uh, it's a report called bunker fuel, just like it should be called. And I said, is this public? He said, oh, yes. And I said, do you have it by ports in the US? And do you have it by foreign flag and American domestic flag? Oh, yes. Report covers all that. And so I'm thinking, gosh, this is just so exciting. And I said, if it's public, can you send it to me? And he said, oh, yes, be happy to. I was working at the Philadelphia Inquirer at the time. And he said, now, you're at the Inquirer, right? And, he's, and he said, uh, you're only a few blocks from the main public library, right? I said, oh, yes. He said, well, the government documents room, they're a repository of this report. So I said, OK. So I'll just go over there. On my lunch hour, I went over there. And, and Don and I had come to know all the people in the government documents room for years and years because of stuff we'd worked on. And I went to a woman, librarian, who I knew, and I asked her, I said, do you get a report called Bunker Fuel? And she looked at me like I was the 20th person that morning to ask for that report. And she said, oh, yes, yes, we get to, we've gotten that. And what I wanted to do was get it back several years. So again, you could bring this perspective to the story. So I said, how far back do you have it? And this was back in the mid-'80s or something like that. And she leaves to her little card file, and she says, 1907. <laughs> so I have never used a bunker fuel report since. Probably never will use a bunker fuel report again. But that's the way to think of documents. You have to think each time, where can you find something? How can you use it? And, and, and how it will work. The only way you can really do this that I have found over time is adopt, and this is the title of what I'm talking about today, a document state of mind. You have to assume the material is out there until you're proven wrong. And it, it's not there. But almost always, you're going to find something. You just have to keep thinking what it might be, where it might be, and take it from there. The document state of mind is a term we came up with many years ago, which has now kind of morphed into what I call uh, a web state of mind or an internet state of mind, because everything that used to be purely in paper is now very much <coughs> on the web. And the most recent example of this, which I have to tell you about, because this gets to the heart of thinking how you might use something. Don and I did a story for Vanity Fair, where I now do most of my work, a few years back at the outset, that had to do with uh, the outset of the Iraqi war. When that began, the United States decided it would be much better if the Iraqis had photos of George Washington and Abe Lincoln and uh, Ben Franklin and other such people on their bills rather than Saddam Hussein. So this required an airlift of billions of dollars from the US to Iraq at the outset of the war. It paid pensioners, it paid the civil service, it gave other Iraqis walking around money. Over a period of about 13 or 14 months, the US airlifted uh, $12 billion in cash to the Iraqis. And the way they did this was, it was one of the most colorful stories I think Don and I have ever done. The money came out of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. And the, the Federal Reserve Bank's warehouse is in the, the Meadowlands just west of Manhattan, uh, near where the Giants and the Jets play football. It's in a big box that has no name on it. It looks like a Walmart store, or I don't know what your big box stores are here in the, uh, in the United Kingdom, but it's a huge faceless thing with cars whizzing by on all sides. Largest repository of US cash in the world is in that building. And that's the warehouse, the money warehouse of the Federal Reserve Bank. Well, over 13 or 14 months, 
<coughs> they would take this cache, which was shrink wrapped. Think of shrink wrapped toys or detergent boxes or things on forklifts being loaded into 18 wheeler trucks. That's what this was like. Like 12, 13 of these shipments, they would put them in these trucks. Trucks went down the New Jersey Turnpike to Washington to Andrews Air Force Base, loaded onto huge cargo planes. The next morning, they're in Iraq. So our story was, there had been a little publicity about this when it happened, but kind of then went away. So our story was, where did the money begin? Uh, how did it get over there? What happened to it after it was there? Who was watching out to see if it was properly uh, accounted for? And so on down the line. Well, the one neat part of the story was that the government had let a contract to a company in California to actually oversee the money to see exactly did it, did it all go to the right places. And uh, this company was one of the more mysterious parts of the whole story because when we dug into its background, you might think it was into accounting or some sort of financial transactions of that sort. Every previous uh, business record of this company, which is watching the 12 billion, you know what their projects had been in San Diego? Uh, second and third bathrooms and houses, recreation rooms, putting an addition on a house, home remodeling. Anyway, we asked for a Freedom of Information Act request the U.S. government, the Defense Department, to explain a little bit more about this contract. What came back to us was almost everything was blacked out, redacted. Uh, the name of the company was there, but the president wasn't there, but they left enough of the phone number that we could sort of figure out at San Diego. The strangest thing they did, though, and we only figured out, like when you held this up, I should have, I should have projected, but anyway, when you held it up, 90% of the, of the contract was blacked out, redacted. But the one thing that wasn't redacted was the mailing address of the company. And our theory was they ran out of black ink by the time they got to that. And it was called N-3813 Nassau, the Bahamas. So we thought, this is really strange. This is a US government contractor, and their mailing address is a post office box in the Bahamas. Anyway, some, somebody had to go to the Bahamas, and I, I volunteered. <laughs> And when I got there, believe it or not, there were actually some records that were public about, not the post office box per se, but about the company that had been set up down there. And then we did a different kind of thing. That was the normal thing you would do. You go to the records, you try to see what's there, see how much you can learn. And it was helpful because we could see who the guy who set it up was. But here was the key thing, and this gets back to the document state of mind, or the web state of mind. And this is something you can do today that you couldn't do a few years ago. And that's the thing I want to emphasize here. And that's why this, we're in really kind of a golden age of journalism in some ways, and what's at our fingertips. It occurred to one of us to take this post office box and just plug it into a search engine. Okay, up pops a document, a very obscure document from a bankruptcy court in Florida and it turns out the same post office box had been the center of a multi-million uh, dollar, hundreds of millions of dollars offshore tax fraud. People from all over the world had invested in this, this entity and lost you know, millions of dollars. The same people who were operating out of that post office box were also operating as a U.S. government contractor. So it made a, it was another piece of the story that showed how the government, in terms of the way they were to watch over this money, had completely blown that job in every possible way. And that sort of brings me to another point I want to stress. This was yet another piece of the whole puzzle of explaining uh, what this process had been like and how the U.S. government, for whatever reason, had completely abrogated any civic responsibility toward watching over this $12 billion in money that was airlifted to Iraq. Um, and that's the point I want to make about documents. There's rarely what I would call a blockbuster document. I mean, pretend you're in a movie and the camera zooms in on it like that. That's just not the way it happens. Each one of these is very important to the story. 
but it's only when you get enough of them assembled that you can kind of see generally and overall exactly what's going on. So that's why even when you may collect something at some point, it may be a lot more significant than you realize at the time. But ultimately, when you get everything pieced together, just as kind of a roundup on that story for what, uh, uh, for what it's worth, um, what we found was that of the $12 billion that was airlifted, uh, essentially 9 to 10 just completely vaporized. I'm never able to figure out exactly where it went. One of the more demanding parts of this, and again, documents played a role in the early part of this. There was one congressional hearing about this, and during that congressional hearing, one fellow who'd headed the transportation ministry in Baghdad after all this happened testified. And I called him up, and he was great. He was then out of government by the time, back into private enterprise and so forth. And I asked him about the, uh, what it was like over there. I said, did he ever see any of the money? He said, yes. The money um, would pay very often American contractors. And a soldier would go down. The mo when it, the money came into Baghdad, a lot of it came to Saddam Hussein's former palace, which was the heart of the US provisional government's uh, headquarters at the time. The money would come in there and would go down the basement to a safe that had been Saddam Hussein's safe. And the money would go in there supposedly for self-keep. And I asked him, I said, did you ever see this safe? Did you ever go there? I said, no, that was off limits to me. I didn't have the provision. But I, I knew some soldiers who, who were there. Do you think some of it went to Dick Cheney? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we, we thought for a long time it could easily have been uh, what we call black ops operation in the U.S., that this was a way to uh, uh, funnel it somewhere else uh, because they clearly had no interest in over, overseeing how it was spent. Uh, but anyway, he, he gave me the name of some soldiers that he, he'd seen, that he'd seen bring this up. And he also related this amazing story. He said, when they had to pay an American contractor, the guys would go downstairs with a wheelbarrow because some of this money was in small bills. <laughs> they would put it all in the wheelbarrow and bring it up to the upper floors and pay the contractor like on a table like this stacked you know, a couple of feet high, which is American currency. He gave me the names of some soldiers. And through various databases, I was able to find one of them as a very long process. I rarely use anonymous sources, by the way. I, I rarely use them to quote. Uh, we will use them to get information, but then we'll try to use, we'll try to use them in some other way. We'll, we'll use that information and try to fill it in some other way. Because we've, sometimes you have to use anonymous sources. I understand that. And this is a story where I did use one. But the public in the US, anyway, has just increasingly become very, very suspicious of anonymous sources. They're not sure if they can trust the journalism for that reason. So from, among other reasons, we try to find a document. We try to find something else. But in this case, this fellow had pointed me to some soldiers who had actually been in the vault. And eventually, I was able to find one who I did not quote by name because he was still on active duty in the military. But it was through a series of databases that led me to his parents' house. And his mother told me, yes, I'll give you his phone number. He's in Guam now. And he was actually very cooperative. But he understood right away that I was, that I was not going to uh, quote him. The idea was to get the information, not to, uh, not to in any way embarrass him. The internet is absolutely globalizing this process anymore of documents. I mean, the way I was able to find the soldier was only because of the availability, the access to many of those databases. That was absolutely important. It used to be when you were looking at court records, you almost had to go in the US to that particular city. Now, I can, if I had my laptop right here, I could look right now at any court, in the, any court, federal court, bankruptcy otherwise in the US, right here, 24-7 with access. That is a revolution, and I just cannot emphasize what that puts at our hands. And the PACER, which is the, docu the database I'm talking about, is not just, I mean, it's principally from the US. But because commerce is increasingly globalized, uh, many, many companies in the UK and other parts of Europe have many filings through PACER as well. So it's a great thing to know about. It's very inexpensive. You have to set up a little account with the federal courts. It's very simple to do. 
I was in New Orleans for the most recent conference of investigative reporters and editors. And I spent a couple of days um, with some Danish journalists uh, talking about reporting and the way you find things. And one of them made my day when he said, I use Pacer all the time. And I had no idea, really, frankly, that any journalist in Denmark would be using Pacer. But it shows you again how things have become so globalized. Things aren't just locked in one particular company. Um, also, when I was there, and this is the other reason I enjoy a conference like this, I'm talking to you now, but in the time I've been here, a lot of you have been talking to me. And I've been, I found out about a lot of things that I was totally unaware of. Because that's the way things are. Nobody can know everything. We're always in a constant state of learning new things and, and benefiting from that. The Danish folks I, I spent some time with, uh, we talked about Companies House, which is like the Security and Exchange Commission in the US here. I, kn I know there was one whole session here on Companies House earlier in, in, the, in the week. But in addition to that, I mean, I know that one. But from my Danish uh, session, I found out there's a totally another database that's even vaster and bigger called opencorporates.com. It's a, a revelation to me. And I went on it after the session. And it has a few companies on it. I think it's up to 104 million is the total number now. They had subsidiaries of US corporations operating in you know, Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium, so on down the line. Things that were just much more easier to access, frankly, than, than the SEC decade. So it just, I, to me, it just, just proves one more step about how we're all constantly learning about these things, finding new sources of information. I just ask you a question. Do you think the subprime fiasco links back to this jerry-built housing <coughs> Was, Is there no, no more It was before that. The subprime mortgage crisis in the US. A lot of the housing <coughs> that figured in the subprime mortgage crisis was actually good housing. The bad thing were the mortgages. Yeah, yeah. The, th the story I worked on earlier was the reverse of that. The housing was bad. <laughs> the mortgages were OK, and a, and a windfall for a lot of people. One other thing I want to I stress about documents, which I don't think is very widely known. In addition to the color, the accuracy, the fact you can find things that you didn't know existed, uh, is one other great thing. They allow you very often to tackle a big subject a subject larger than one source, or even a group of sources. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, Don and I did a huge project on the international oil industry. At a the time, there were all kinds of cutbacks and shutdowns. In fact, some of the reporting was right here, uh, which I did from Lloyd's of London in the old building down on Leadenhall Street, which I think is, all of you who are from London, I, I think that building's now gone. I think when they built the new Lloyd's, they tore it down. I was actually going to visit it as, kind of, as a memory of a, a wonderful reporting trip, but apparently it's gone. But anyway, as part of this trip, uh, we were looking at oil supplies. At the time, there were stories right and left how the world was running out of oil. This was 1973, newspapers, magazines, television stations. The world is running out of oil. We have 10 years of oil left in the world. Do the math. I'm telling you. These things were widespread at the time. Someday that's going to be true. Uh, someday, right. But it wasn't true then. And in fact, w even we underestimated how much oil is really out there. Mm -hmm. The only point we were making is that, and it wasn't saying we shouldn't do alternative sources or anything like that, but we're just saying this story is wrong. This is being done for a different reason. And the reason was, was clearly to create the notion of a shortage. And the minute you create that notion, then the prices skyrocket which is exactly what happened back in the 70s. I mean, I did some work here uh, at Lloyd's uh, tracking shipments out of the Persian Gulf uh, that year and, and previous years showing there was no abatement. And in fact, they were uh, considerable. Uh, went to other oil ports in Europe. And one of my favorite stories, and I told this yesterday, and anybody who was in the class yesterday, forgive me. I got to tell this story again, because it was. Um, one of the places I went to was Genoa. Genoa was the leading oil port of, of Italy. And the reason I'm telling you this story is you never assume where you're going to find information. You never assume who's going to have it. And I was under the impression at the time, the time 
that the Italian uh, statisticians were behind the Americans in terms of the collection of information. Being a typical American jingo artist, I, I thought, well, of course, we're ahead of everybody on these things. I've learned a lot since then, folks, believe me. Uh, anyway, I went to Genoa. A friend of mine was living in Italy, spoke fluent Italian. We finally found the Port Authority of Genoa, which was the overseer of these. And we found a guy down in the basement who was the statistician for the Port Authority. And my friend asked him in Italian, did he have any statistics on oil imports? Because what we wanted to show was during this cutback, supposedly Genoa would have been cut back, as other ports in Europe supposedly would be cut back. Well, Antonio, as far as I can tell, had never in his entire life seen a journalista. And nobody in his entire life had ever asked for his data. This is something to always remember. People who collect data, they love to share their data. <laughs> you just have to remember to ask them for their data. And they will be very happy in many cases to share it because they're frustrated most of the time that people don't want to see their data because <laughs> that is their life. Anyway, my friend in Italian asking for the statistics during this cutback period. Antonio is beside himself, runs to a file cabinet, pulls these out, brings them back proudly like he's serving a meal. And I asked my friend in Italian, I said, well, get the rest of the year. Antonio is excited, brings it all out. And I said, ask him for the previous year. Antonio is by this time almost beside himself. Not only have I asked for recent data, past data. And anybody who collects data, they love the past data almost as much as the current data. I'm just throwing that in because I know half this conference is also data, de devoted to data collection. But anyway, and I looked at these numbers. You didn't even need a, 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 you didn't need a calculator or anything to look at this right away. You could tell during the period of this cutback the oil imports into Italy were substantially up. So totally flying in the face of the notion that this was a problem. So I asked him, I said, would you ask him what's going on here? So he asked him in Italian, he says, it's a joke. There's more oil around than there ever was. It's been a way for the oil companies to jack up prices and so on and so forth. Uh, who knew about that? But that, that, of course, that was in fact the result of this. When I was in college, uh, I had a wonderful history professor in Kansas City. I realized I didn't tell you anything about my background, did I? I'll, I'll digress in a minute on that. And I've never forgotten one thing this great history professor said. He said, history is very often made by what people think is happening, not by what is really happening. And that theory has actually guided me um, through a lot of my work. By the way, I'll digress and tell you just a little bit about myself, and then we'll get back to, to where we are on this. Um, I was in, when I was in, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, which is in the very middle of the United States, an area called the Middle West, uh, 1,300 miles from New York and Washington, Philadelphia, 1,600 miles from uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, middle. And in high school there, I worked on my high school newspaper, and I absolutely fell in love with news. Before that, I always had been kind of interested in writing and playing with words and typewriters, like to push the keys. But I really wasn't focused until then. And I, I just loved the process of gathering information. And I particularly liked it at the high school I went to because the principal was a classic stuffed shirt. And one of those guys was, had, as far as I could tell, had never cracked a joke or understood a joke <laughs> in his entire life. So he was very, it was a lot of fun to like stick a needle into him, which my advisor was very tolerant of. Um, so right away I understood this is, very, this is a lot of fun to poke holes in people who are full of themselves. In my first year in college, I uh, got a job on the Kansas City Times, which was my hometown newspaper. Uh, the Times was the morning edition of the Kansas City Star, a much more well-known name. Uh, and the way they would hire you, they would hire you as a copy boy temporarily. And if you did certain things well, then they would promote you to a reporter where you wouldn't do anything very significant in the beginning. But, so I was a copy boy, ran copy in those days. You just, you, you rolled it up in a pneumatic, in, in a plastic tube, sent it to the composing room where guys on machines would set it in so-called hot type, very noisy process. I love the place. The minute I walked in, I've never forgotten. The smell of the newsprint, the smell of the ink, I just, oh wow, this is, 
I guess if you wanted to be a florist, it'd be like walking into a flower shop, you know, that same idea. Anyway, it was just a wonderful place. So within a few months, they made me a reporter, and what I did was I wrote obituaries. The Star, the, the Times published obituaries free. And those would be little things. John Jones, 75, of such and such address, died yesterday at the home or such and such hospital. He worked for 40 years at Jones, blah, blah, blah. He was a member of the Elks Lodge. He went to St. Mary's Catholic Church. Survived by his wife. I mean, no creativity in these at all. That's what the whole idea of them. You cannot believe, though, how many potential mistakes you can make in a one paragraph obituary, though. <laughs> and I found this out one day. The Gruff City editor there, um, it was a character, he was so extreme, you, you couldn't put him in a movie today. He, he had a microphone at his desk, and when you, he wanted to see you, he would say, Mr. Steele approached the desk, <laughs> and he would approach the desk, and he would say, Steele, how, do, uh, how, do you, how did Mr. Smith spell his name? I said, well, S-M-I-T-H. I said, well, that's the way you spelled it. But that's not the way he spelled it. <laughs> it was S M Y or S M Y M T H U, something. But anyway, big mistake. But I learned a great lesson there, and that is you never assume anything. You never assume anything from the smallest thing. How somebody's name is spelled, what the name of the organization is, where you're going to find a document, who will talk to you. The minute you start assuming those things, you start taking certain things off. You run the risk of a mistake, but more importantly, you run the risk of missing an opportunity. So never assume was one of my, the first lesson I learned in this business. And it's a lesson I learn and relearn basically every week. So uh, anyway, after that, uh, I eventually, I, I covered everything, government, uh, people coming through town. The spark of being interested in investigative reporting was born there, though there really wasn't much of a chance because it was, the paper just didn't do much of that at the time. But I got very frustrated a lot of stories I did because I felt there's more to this than I'm able to report. It was too much of the so-called he said, she said approach to things. So I really wanted to kind of get below those things. It really wasn't until Philadelphia uh, where it was a bigger world in that sense where I was able to finally, finally do those things. Don Barlett and I worked for 27 years at the Philadelphia Inquirer until 1997. And then for the next 10 years, worked at Time Magazine. And since 2006, uh, contributing editors at Vanity Fair. Uh, during this time, uh, co-authored eight books, a couple of them bestsellers. Um, but more importantly, uh, I think pushing and urging and trying to show people uh, the power of some of these new tools we have at our disposal. But back to my story here. Um, and what I was talking about earlier, is that documents let you do these bigger stories that, again, no source or even a group of sources can do. And the oil thing was typical of that. Another uh, big project we did, which uh, was quite controversial at the time, but also beloved, it was both sides of this, was one where we examined what was happening to the American middle class back in the early 1990s. And we showed through statistics and interviews what was happening to average people in the US, how the middle class was actually shrinking. Um, and we showed how various corporate write-offs, which had actually been on the books for many, many years, had suddenly been adopted by companies and used in very detrimental ways in the interest of average people. Um, the series was called America, What Went Wrong? It was, uh, created quite a controversy in the US. The Wall Street Journal actually editorialized, criticizing uh, Don and I in their lead editorial one day. Uh, as, as anyway, it was a famous pop singer in the US at the time, and they would not mean anything to any of, the, any of you at this point, called Sister Soldier. She was an extremely loud and forceful and uh, impressive character. They called us the Sister Soldiers of Economic Populism in the US. Anyway, very controversial. Uh, stuff that's pretty well accepted now, and by the way. We also wrote shortly thereafter about the top 1%, which has, of course, loomed in significance in the US and, and really around the world pretty much uh, since then. Where did the top 1% data come from? No secret, no, no magic uh, think tank out here that had somehow or another cracked the numbers. 
all out of statistics of income of the IRS. Every time I talk to people about investigative reporting, I try to assure them, look, a lot of this work isn't that dramatic. It's very systematic, and you run the risk of falling asleep with some of these numbers from time to time. But if you can stick with it, the outcome can be very exciting, very dramatic, and very significant toward uh, people understanding you know, what's happening with something like this. Um, so anyway, um, we showed in particular how one, one uh, corporate tax break had gone off the charts and had been used by a lot of corporate buyout companies to shut down plants, to shut down companies, to take the assets for themselves. This was a deduction called, now don't fall asleep, the net operating loss deduction. This had been on the books for decades. So what we went back is we, we pulled together 50 years of data by using 50 different IRS reports during that time. Exciting, huh? And then plugged it into an Excel spreadsheet. Actually, back then we used a, a forerunner of Excel, but the same concept. And we showed for years and years, this thing had gone along like this, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, suddenly in the 80s, psh, people had figured out a new way to use it and were using it in a very detrimental way to average Americans. But again, in plain sight, they're not exciting to find or, 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 or to, to do the work, but the end results can be very exciting. Um, over the years, we've also found there's some cases you can actually use documents uh, to tell a story when people will not talk to you at all. Uh, did a big profile of the company Monsanto a few years ago, and essentially Monsanto would say very little. Monsanto, which developed the genetically modified seeds. Uh, soybeans, uh, corn, cotton, um, sugar beets. They're working on some others now. Uh, in the United States, 95% of the soybeans planted are Monsanto's, are, are genetically modified seeds. But what's not so well known about them is Monsanto has something called a seed police. So any farmer who wants to just have regular seeds uh, and, and one of the Monsanto seeds blows into their land, the seed police visit them, very often accuse them of improperly using Monsanto seeds. Farmers very often settle, agree not to do it. But rather uh, Gestapo-like tactics that they use in the fields, American fields on these things. Well, even in, nobody would talk about this, and we zeroed in on one particular farming group that had been sued by Monsanto. And even in the court papers, in the federal court papers, they had affidavits, declarations, where Monsanto itself acknowledged how they were filming these farmers in their fields, their houses, coming out of stores. In other words, just completely oversight of the way they went about their business. I, in, a million years, I, in a million years, I never would have thought somebody, a company, would have acknowledged such a thing. But there it was for all to see. Is GM accepted in America widely, all over the country? Because here we still have the debate about it, it's not allowed to be generally. It's not accepted. I mean, it's, it's legal. So they and are I'm, using GM. Oh, yes. Like yeah, but there's still a lot of controversy about it. Mm -hmm. and there's, yes, and but it is going ahead. They're doing it. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but, the, a lot of people, but there's a big debate in the U.S. now about labeling the products yeah. that are produced from those seeds so that the consumer knows about them. Um, so yes, it's it's a, and during questions, anybody wants to talk about that, we can we can talk about that. Another thing about documents that I really want to stress, and this is as important as anything, they give us as journalists a certain amount of independence. Uh, the thing that all of us go through, and I remember this as a young reporter. I remember talking to politicians. I remember talking to community leaders of all kinds. People would tell me things. And I would wonder half the time, is this person lying to me? I mean, isn't that kind of the universal thing we as journalists, when we talk to people in any kind of authority, we wonder, did they know, are they lying to me, or is this true? You're always trying to sort that out. And I think that's one of the great things about the documents. If you, if you have a little opportunity before you interview somebody, so you have a little background, this gives you a certain idea of whether or not this person knows what they're talking about. Sometimes it's not just a matter of lying. 
I mean, we have, we have the kind of society anymore where, because it's particularly, I think, brought along partly because of television, is that I've, I can't tell you the number of times where I've been traveling and I will see a news report where um, the reporter sticks the microphone in somebody's face. It could be a congressman, a senator, could be somebody else in power, and they will ask a question, and the person will completely ignore the question and answer something else. And the reporter turns around and looks us right in the eye and says, well, there you have it. And of course, you don't have it. But it's like somebody, it's like there's a book out there. I joke about this. There's a book out there that all these people read beforehand. There How not to answer a question? There is a TV sitcom called Yes Minister in which exactly that advice is given. Well, it's, all of us, I'm sure, have encountered that, that phenomena um, many times. But I think documents give you a way of some of that independence. When I, I like to always read something if I can before I interview. And what I very often do, once I do that, and I've gone to somebody who's supposedly an expert, I will actually answer, or, or ask a couple of questions where the answer is very, very clear just to see exactly how that person handles that answer. And it's one of those little guideposts I have as, as to whether or not maybe this person knows what they're talking about. To me, the five worst words in journalism, I can trust this person. I can't tell you the number. I know sometimes we have to do that, but to me, it is scary. Because all the great hucksters in this world, everywhere, every country, every nation, and every era, are the most convincing people you will ever meet. Talk to the people who were uh, swan song by Bernard Madoff, for example, and years before that by the famous Charles Ponzi in Boston who looked like he could do no wrong. The greatest hucksters are extremely persuasive and make you think they know exactly what they're talking about. Tony Blair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, and and one, of, one of my favorite stories on this, uh, any of you know the American uh, true crime writer by the name of Anne Rule? Yes. She writes nonfiction uh, books based on real events, and she'll take a real case and dissect these things. Well, early in her career, her, her whole family had had roots in law enforcement. Things like that. I think her father had been somehow associated with her uncle. I can't remember the exact details, but she knew about law enforcement. And before she began writing, she worked in a, a call center where people would call in distressed. I, my, I, I think it was. You're going to give me the hook? I'm going to give you that. I'm going to encourage you to take questions. Okay, okay, good. Um, one, we'll do it with this one last story. Okay. And. Uh, she, um, in this call center, right next to her is a very handsome young man who was uh, also there. I, th I think it was suicide, and very often he would walk her to her car after one of these uh, sessions, like at night, and just as a courtesy and said, you just never know what's out there. It's a dangerous world. Well, they went their own ways. Uh, she went on to write books, and uh, one night she gets a call from him years later, and he tells her, he said, I just wanted to let you know that you're going to read about me in the papers or hear about me tomorrow, and I just wanted to say hello. You know who this guy was? Yes. Ted Bundy. <laughs> Ted Bundy was perhaps the worst mass murderer in American history, uh, killed 20, 25, 30 women. Um, she was completely taken in by his charm. Um, his ability to relate to people. So I'm not saying you don't trust everybody, but check them out. <laughs> yes, I could go on as you can see, so let's, let's hear from some of you. Um, yeah, so it, it's about the, all of the data that you collect around the, the story. Um, and it, maybe it's the sort of obsessive hoarder in me, but it seems that that, that data has great value perhaps for a story in the future. But certainly, to go back to your Rembrandt example, for historians. Um, so, I mean, do you keep all of the data on all of your stories going, going way back? Yeah, everything's been kept. We've been, we've been donating our papers to a university, some of the older things, but we still uh, 
still have access to it, but that's fairly recent. In fact, there was kind of a funny story when Don and I moved from the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is in Philadelphia, to Time Magazine in New York. Uh, the fellow who was responsible at Time for moving, all, they said, we'll move all your papers. And he joked with us. He said, it's going to take a little longer than we thought because they're going to have to reinforce the 45th floor <laughs> because of all your boxes. One of the great things about our time now, of course, is there's very few papers. You know, so many things are say, anytime I even get papers now, I PDF them uh, and make sure there are multiple copies of it and all that sort of thing. So the volume is down and easier to search. Yes, sir? You said about trusting your sources. Um, has there ever been a time in your career that actually you've been led astray by documents? So documents <coughs> have been doctored or planted. Um, and if so, what do you do to avoid a situation where you can be uh, misled by the documents that fall into your possession? Um, things that um, have been amended um, in a way to, to lead you as the journalist astray? A uh, very good question. I don't know of one that we ever found out afterward was was wrong. I mean, sometimes during the process we would come across things. Uh, the one project that really comes to mind that I remember very well, the first book Don and I ever did, a book which, by the way, is still in print, um, was a full-scale biography of Howard Hughes, the famous businessman, political influencer, aviator, movie man, crazy man, uh, hypochondriac, and while Hughes was very secretive, literally thousands of documents came into court proceedings after his death. And so, some of these did not appear to be valid. I mean, the most famous one, of course, is the Melvin Dumar will, which was the guy who supposedly said he picked up Hughes in the desert outside Las Vegas. You know, that was clearly a fraudulent document. But there were others that were kind of in a twilight zone where you really weren't sure and so when we're not sure, we just don't use something. Uh, but very often in, in the case, his case, you could see the handwriting. You could also see how it fit with other issues that were going on at the time. And sometimes you have to make a guess. Uh, but most documents, I mean, the, the, the thing which we use, like court records, PDF things, uh, those are valid. Uh, the same kind of thing out of the government agencies. Uh, People talk about lobbying in the U.S. and they think of campaign contributions and lobbyists in Congress, but most of the lobbying is not in Congress. It's in the agencies. Like in the U.S., it would be the Home Office and however that process works over here. Uh, that's where most of the great lobbying goes on. And that's the area that the press in the U.S. covers the least. You know, they focus on Congress, things of that sort. So sometimes you will see uh, submissions in there that uh, if it comes under that agency, you, you, you have to assume it's probably pretty good. I mean, maybe the point somebody's making isn't good, but the document's a legitimate document. And uh, we've had other people give us things from time to time that were just questionable. We've been lucky enough not to have ever run something that we later had to say was, was fraudulent, but it's, it's, it is a real concern sometimes. Um, I lived in America for 10 years, which was a great experience. And one of the best years when I was there with my husband, late husband, was as housekeeper to a um, very rich couple of multi-millionaires who were very sincere Democrats. And um, they were planning to go to Washington with the Congress when, when, if we got elected. And that's part of why we took the job, because that would be very interesting indeed get to Washington. Um, but of course, Duke Hall was lost. And he was never mentioned again. But I think that our boss could have been something quite high up in the government, because he's one of his closest friends. He said he'd been a very close friend for 25 years <coughs> at Duke And because he expected a really good job in the administration. And it's quite horrifying to know that our, our employees <coughs> The most serious paper they ever read was the Boston Globe. And they didn't seem to um, be much interested in the rest of the world, really, of anything that happened elsewhere, and yeah. that seemed to be the limit of their, uh, their awareness. This is sort of a, sort of a, 
general problem in the United States. I mean, I think part of it stems from the size of the country. It's sort of a continent unto oh, itself. Sorry. And uh, a lot of, there's a lot of ignorance about the rest of the world. I'll be the first to admit that. I think in some ways in the U.S. it's becoming worse. And, and it bothers me a lot and because this is my business, journalism. If I go back to look at the paper I started on and pull out a front page from like the early 1960s and look at that A section of that newspaper, there was more world news in that paper then than there is today in their A section. And I think that part of it's the shrinkage of the paper, but also it's a conscious decision that a lot of papers have made, like, well, there's the internet out there, there's all kinds of ways people get this, there's television, blah, blah, blah. But the fact of the matter is a lot of people depend on what they read or see daily. And I actually think in some ways a lot of Americans know less about the world today than they might have years ago. Yes? Can you talk to the practical logistics of doing uh, investigative journalism? Because most people here at the newspapers will not be part of the investigative unit. So strategizing, how do you do good work? How do you, how do you set up your daily week, your, your, okay. your average week, and get things done? And can you also address how long did you spend on every project? <laughs> One of my former editors didn't plant that story with you, did he? <laughs> um, not enough time, by the way. No, anyway, I'm just kidding. I, that's really a good question. I'm glad you asked it because um, the first thing before I get into a specific, uh, there is a significant difference between investigative reporting and daily or weekly reporting. And it has nothing to do with intelligence. It has nothing to do with that at all. It has to do with the pace. When you're doing a daily story or even a weekly story, you're facing a, a very immediate kind of deadline that you're pretty much going to have to meet. Uh, when you're doing an investigative piece where you keep trying to push further and further, uh, that deadline usually isn't there. I mean, it's there in a way, and you're working hard, but it's not so immediate. And as a result of that, a lot of people find the pace of investigative projects uh, to be very disturbing because you have many days where it's like you're pushing string uphill. But that's all part of the process of eliminating, opening those doors to see what's behind them, to see what you may, what may be there. And so you have a lot of dry holes um, and you never know when you're going to find one like that night where I'm reading the Tax Reform Act and voila, there's this thing. Uh, anyway. So that, I think that's the first thing. What we do on an investigative project, once an idea comes to us, and the ideas come from all over. I know some people, they won't, they won't do something unless it's their idea, which to me is one of the dumbest things in the world. I mean, is the idea a good idea? If it's a good idea, go with it. Make it yours. That's the, I mean, the Monsanto idea, our editor at Vanity Fair, I think it was him, saw the movie Michael Clayton. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that movie. Uh, Tom Wilkinson's one of the prime actors, Tilda Swinton, George Clooney. And it's the story about litigation over a, a weed killer and does it really cause cancer? Anyway, the editor came back for, and he said, what's the real weed killer company like? Simple question like that, curiosity. And that led to the story. So ideas come from all over. Once they happen, we do, we never interview off the bat. We do the reading, very often might start with secondary sources, start seeing what primary sources might be around, start seeing the areas that start to emerge. Uh, Don and I, over the years, one of us would see one area, and that person generally would follow that and write that section. Um, I would see another and do the same thing. Once we would uh, start writing, we would exchange this with each other before we ever sent it to an editor, so that we would very uh, rigorously edit each other. Uh, one of the biggest changes that we had over the years when we were young, we used to save up everything to write at the end, which is one of the dumber things we ever did. And I heartily encourage any of you, whether or not you're working on short range stories or long range stories, write as you go along. Um, there's several values to this. One is, I don't mean the whole story, but just maybe it's a piece of the story. Maybe it's a person within that story. Maybe it's a program. Whatever it is, write it. because. Once you write it, you think, 
I've written things where I thought, boy, there's, there's, I, I, I got more work to do here, and I'd write it and say, no, I don't, it's done. And then other things I thought were done, I wrote them, there was this giant hole in it that I had totally forgotten about. The writing process is very much interwoven with the reporting process for that reason. So I'm a great advocate of write as you go along, write as much as you can, blaze that trail that's gonna have to be rewritten anyway. And all writing is really rewriting. Rewriting is the heart of writing. I know sometimes on daily stuff, we don't have the time to do that. The gun's at our head, we have gotta get it out. I understand that. But any time you've got any time, take it. Even if it's an hour. I've developed a theory that the mind is like the other muscles in our body. And when you use it a lot, it just kind of gets tight like that, right? And so if you just walk away from it a little bit, it just relaxes. Have you ever noticed how you just go away from something a little while that's been stopping you, and you'll come back and suddenly the horizon opens and you've figured out a way to solve this problem that seemed insoluble just a few minutes before that. So that's the general process. Once we would get something written, whether it was whatever it was, we would, we would very often share sections with an editor, uh, just to see, do you like this, do you like that? Just to keep everybody in the loop. <coughs> it wasn't anything formal as a rule, but just to make sure this is what we've got, how do you like it? Once it's all kind of done and edited, then there's a, a lot of going back and forth between editors and yourself, because everybody needs to be edited. All my reporter friends don't like me to say that, but it, in fact, is true. Uh, everybody, everybody needs it. So you go back and forth to arrive at what appears to be good. Then usually the top editors would come in and they would have their theory as well. And so there would be more things to that. Once that's done, it's not true at or in newspapers, but at magazines, the biggest surprise I had at Time Magazine was the whole fact-checking department. Newspapers do not have fact-checkers as a rule. You fact-check fact your own stuff. In fact, I've always continued to fact-check my own stuff. But at magazines, they actually have departments where they go through everything. Is, uh, Bristol really 150 kilometers from London, or what simple things like that to more significant things, like what did Tony Blair know at some point, <laughs> anyway. But what I'm saying is they, they check everything. And then Vanity Fair, the same, the same process. Uh, most of the, the new websites, the, the investigative journalism centers, the nonprofits, most of them all have fact-checking departments now. So that whole process much more sophisticated than it used to be. Then the lawyers get involved, and the lawyers may have some problems. The worst experience we ever almost had with a, with a lawyer was when we did our Howard Hughes book, which had some very uh, contentious stuff in it about the people who worked for him, some of whom were later indicted, by the way. And we got a young lawyer for a big New York law firm because the, the main guys are away on Nantucket for the summer or something like that. Try not to get the, the, the two young lawyers because they get scared. The guy basically wanted to take out every proper name in the story, the book. Imagine how exciting that would have been to read. So anyway, um, so you go through all of these processes. And I think that's the thing. When people see a story, an investigative story, in a paper or on TV, they have no idea this backstory. Because then even after something runs, People will send you letters and saying, you've maligned me, you've done this, and you have to answer those and, and come and show them how wrong they are. So there's a huge thing beyond just the story itself that, that they have, the public has no knowledge of.